Hi, everybody. Welcome. I'm Katal from the Hoffman Institute at INSEAD. And the mission of the Hoffman Institute is to integrate sustainability and impact throughout everything that the school does. I'm going to be your host today for this lifelong learning event entitled Mission Above Strategy, the Estilo Story. In this conversation, what we're going to do is that we're going to explore, um, you know, the tagline of INSEAD, business as a force for good, or more specifically, these businesses which intentionally integrate uh, societal progress at their core to see what they look like and what it takes to get there. And I'm going to be doing this um, together with a guest who've been at it in the same company for at least two decades. This guest today, our guest is Hubert Sagnier, INSEAD MBA 86J. Welcome home, Hubert. Back to the roots. So, Hubert, the personal part of your wiki page um, is a little thin, right? I try to look for some personal information about you online, but there's not much. There's not much. So I thought I'll share a few facts. Fun facts, I, as I introduce you, right? So you spend your childhood in Algeria and then were raised in France. You were trained as a commercial pilot, but you never worked as a commercial pilot. You started your career managing small companies in Tahiti. You did your MBA at INSEAD, so that we all know by now. But so did two of your five children, Xavier and Yves. You struggled to find a job after INSEAD, that's true. That's good for us to be here. And when you finally wow. did, when you finally did, you were fired after three months. That's not true. Okay. You then opened a decoration store in Paris and you kept That's true. less wow. than a year. And you finally joined Estilo. You moved to Canada. You stayed there 33 years to eventually become the vice chairman and the CEO, and more recently, you finalized the merge with Lux Luxotica to become vice chairman of Essilor Luxotica, which is your current position. So we all know that. You're joining us today from Quebec, from rural Quebec, which is where your uh, family base is. You're waiting a snowstorm that is on its way and hopefully won't disturb this <laughs> webinar. And you, um, two weeks a year, you um, join some cross-country Arctic expeditions to refuel. You've done that for 25 years. So of course, I want to learn more about that. Everybody does, but this is not- but Not today, talking. please. That's not what we're gonna be talking about today, unfortunately. What we're gonna be talking about today together is how you have engineered and led the transformation of Estilor's business model to focus on one mission, which is improving lives by improving sight. Meaning that your big, big goal is to eliminate poor vision from the world by 2050. So now that is part of societal progress that we just said. So together with the 900 people who signed up to this event today, I'm very eager to hear about your journey, how you got Estilor to uh, get close to that goal. Um, just before we start the q and I thought it would be great for, you know, all the members of the audience who may not be familiar with Essilor Luxotica, for you to tell us about the company, um, what it does, and um, just do the, you know, the basic introduction of uh, Essilor Luxotica. Over to you, Hubert. Thank you. Well, Katel, you did your search. I'm impressed because it's hard to find. <laughs> well, yeah, Essilor Luxotica, you know, this is the merge we did um, three years ago between... Uh, to uh, leaders of the um, optical industry. On one side, they sealer, more on lenses, and um, Luxotica more on uh, frames, retail, uh, and so Few numbers. If you're Luxotica today, this is 170,000 people. It's a market cap of around 55 to 60 billion euro, and uh, around 18, 19 uh, billion sales. But I think behind the number, it's really what we do and how we do things. So today, Katel, you asked me more to concentrate on the Essilor story, which is the lens part. Mm -hmm. uh, at Essilor, we have been uh, invented, creating, uh, manufacturing lenses since basically 1848. So you can measure the uh, cumulative experience that we have 
on all this. And we are doing that for people who have vision issues. In the world today, out of the 8 billion people in the world, around 5 million of, billion of them have visual defects. Mm -hmm. But only 1.7 billion are really correcting their vision, which means we are leaving behind 2.5 to 3 billion people who do not have access, do not have access to eyeglasses for many, many reasons. Price being not by far the first one. Mm -hmm. So the magnitude of the challenge is really huge. And uh, recently, uh, the WHO has measured the impact of the poor vision, uh, not only the economical impact, which is around $270 billion per year, but really also the human impact of those people who can't see well. That's why uh, with ACLR and then at the same time ACLR Luxotica, we decided 20 years ago really to create and to focus all our energy on eradicating poor vision from the world. Uh, first, we started with philanthropy. Philanthropy will not save the world. It's not enough. It's not at the size or the magnitude of the, uh, of the challenge. And then we have developed a lot of programs on uh, inclusive business programs, which are really efficient. Thanks, Hubert. So, um, as you said, uh, Estilor has been at it for, uh, for a number of years. And, uh, and of course, you were the person, not alone, and we will talk about that, but you were really the person who started uh, to push uh, in that direction. So, what I'm, my first question is, uh, where is that drive coming from? Right. I mean, you just saw where you're coming from. You're a commercial pilot. That's not coming yeah. from there. Uh, so where where did that come from? And also connected to that is um, how did you start pushing it at this at Estilor? Because you started way before you were CEO. So what did that look like? And again, wh where is that drive coming from? Well, really, I think we I really think that the corporation has to develop their own mission. Uh, I really think that. A purpose is something that actually could drive everyone around one uh, unique uh, project. And when we talk about a mission, I am not talking about the uh, mission statement that you actually stick uh, on the wall by the coffee machine. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the impact we have. Of course, uh, when you work in the optical industry, you're, you're, you, you have a product which have an immediate impact. When you put eyeglasses on the eyes on someone who has a poor vision, you're changing their life at the same second. You got the smile on her face at the same time. And this is where you really measure the impact you could have on, on people. I think all what we are talking about we have 170,000 people within the Luxotica who had the same experience, having the smile when you're uh, providing eyeglasses on the face of someone. And then you value really what you're doing and you want to do more. And what we are doing now for the past 20 years is just doing more, doing more, more and more, up to what you described very well in your intro, which is now the goal, the objective, is really to eradicate provision from the world in one generation. So do I understand correctly then that uh, what inspired you was uh, these smiles that you that you saw when you joined the company? So when you didn't start as an optimist friend putting, uh, putting glass, uh, glass frames on, on people's face, right? You, you started in a more like a regular job within, uh, within, uh, within a silor. So how, how did that strike you? Uh, how did that impact strike you at first? When did you realize that that was it? And not just a job. And I think it's again, uh, it's, uh, it's when you start to connect the dots. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for years and years, the strategy of the company was really to improve lenses, improve frames, uh, do a better Varilux every five years, a better anti reflective coatings every five years, every three years, uh, which is great. And this is how we build our business on the base of the 1.7 billion people who actually are, are shopping at optical stores, optometrists, or ophthalmologists. But there are still an amount of people who actually don't have access. So step by step, you rely that you just can do more. And, and the impact you're having on the people you can, who can afford purchase eyeglasses, you want to give it to people who can't afford. Yeah. And you start with, and we actually, in my case, 
In our case, we started 25 years ago in Dallas, Texas, with the first Estillor Vision Foundation, like uh, a lot of other companies. Mm. But when you start doing it, when you have the product which have an impact, and when you have the willingness to actually pursue and think big, then you see that you can't stop just uh, next door. You have to do it everywhere in the world. So uh, indeed, when the journey we have been for the past 20 years with all the team. Right. So in, in your case, when you created, as you just mentioned, the Estillor Vision Foundation, you were not CEO of Estillor yet, right? No, no, I don't think you need to be the CEO or, or key manager or whatsoever. I think it's more what you have in your heart, when you have in your soul, and how you're, you're looking at what you are doing. I think any type of companies and any division, any department could find the way to have impact on the world. It's all about how you're looking at what you're doing, looking at maybe twisting a little bit, and we'll come to that, the strategy, depending on your mission, we'll come to that in a minute, I am sure, but it's how you're looking at what you, what you can do and just the willingness to change things. Yeah, so, so thanks for that. I think it's an important message to bring home is that you can start everybody, everybody here today with us. You can start from wherever you are in your company. You don't, don't need to be in the top positions to start and pushing things. Now, tell me a little bit more about how that focused play in your becoming CEO of Estilor, because that's an interesting story too. Ah, so, so you want a more personal story? Yeah, about I want a personal story. Oh, okay. Then we don't have enough of this. I've, I've yeah. you. Well, you know, when, uh, when, you, when, you, when you're successful as, a, as a, an MD or line manager, and uh, I was back then in 2005 uh, leading a seal of America in, the, in, uh, in Dallas, Texas, very successfully, all the, the foundations and all the program around the foundations we created with all the team there was had impact really on the states in, uh, in poor counties and things like this. And then the, you write one day, the board of directors of Essilor came to me and said, Hubert, uh, would you like to uh, actually get ready, be prepared to become the next CEO, the, the timing, the age, everything was fine. You're never ready. And you're, uh, unless you really want that, want that, and you're focused only on these objectives, I was not. It was not my plan at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, I say, yes, but why? I mean, I am doing a lot of things. I have impact not being a CEO <laughs> on what I am doing uh, locally. Um, the, what really triggered my decision to accept was a discussion I had with my brother. Actually. Yes, that's what I want to hear about. Uh, give him a call, we chat about that. And he told me, but Hubert, I mean, since I know you, since you joined ECL, you keep talking about the mission and the impact you're having with your friends, classes. If really you think and you believe into it, Take the job, be the CEO of the company, and develop it worldwide. Hmm. You know the end of the story. In five seconds, he convinced me. I took the job. We developed the Essilor uh, uh, mission department with Sogota, Giant, Anurak, uh, Frederic also, uh, at that time in Singapore, where, which is the heart of uh, now our division because we are surrounded by three billion myopic people who don't have access mm -hmm. to the, the choice of Singapore. Um, and, then, and then, of course, it has been a huge, huge success as far as impact and number of people we are able to help by giving them eyeglasses. So wanted to, uh, to increase uh, your personal role in that was what uh, motivated you to take that post. Is that, is that right? And do you think that's made, that made you a good CEO? Uh, well, <laughs> that's another topic. We can talk one day about what's a good CEO. Uh, I think it's, 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 a, it's a number of things. I think it's a teamwork. Uh, it's not, you don't need to be a CEO to have impact. Right, right. If you can articulate your vision, it gives you a voice. It gives you an audience. Mm. So when you're able to very well articulate your mission, to very well connect the mission with the other key component of, of, of your responsibility as CEO, strategy being one, yeah. then suddenly you can gather and gather everyone, all the stakeholders around what is important, what's the impact you want to have on the world with yeah. your products or your services.
but when I when I listen to you now, when uh, you know when I when you get all energized talking about it, I can see also that that drives does matter in terms of bringing the other ones uh, on board. So your motto, um, your motto after right after you became CEO is mission above strategy, which is why we call that uh, conversation mission above strategy. So what does that mean? What does that mean in practice? Uh, where is it coming from, and and how do you execute on that? Let, let's talk about that a little bit. Well, if there is one, if I have a wish, Katel, yes. just a wish, a wish. Minutes, if, if there is one thing people have to remember, it's really to put the mission above the strategy. Yeah, this is what's actually driving everything. So let, stay with me a minute. <laughs> you know, you have, a, you have a, an industry who could have some impact. Yes, with eyeglasses, we have impact on, uh, on, uh, on the people. Uh, let me tell you a little story. Uh, back then, when I was in Dallas, Texas, with the Sealer Foundation, uh, like everyone, like everyone within the company, we dedicated one or two days to do vision camps. And I was in this elementary school in South Texas uh, uh, doing an um, eye test. Uh, I had in front of me a little uh, nine year uh, Jessica actually was her name, a little nine years old uh, girl. And I checked her my being myopic minus four. I was shocked. Minus four. She can't, just can't see very well. So I went talk to her to her teacher and say, what's about Jessica? Oh yeah, Jessica, you know, sometimes she's uh, I after one hour I'm losing her in the classroom. My God, she's minus four. So we made on the spot eyeglasses. We were outside uh, in the yard. And when I put the eyeglasses on her face, she raised her face. And she looked at the trees and she asked me, what are those little gray, green things which are moving with the wind? It's <laughs> leaves, Jessica. She has no idea there were leaves in the trees. Mm. For her, the trees were a big, massive green thing. So you change life, you change totally the impact and the trajectory of someone. When you, when you feel inside yourself that you have this power of changing or improving the life of people, you have to be very careful mm. you're doing. You have to be very careful on how you're, uh, you're really driving uh, your, uh, your corporation. So step by step, we rely that, well, you, you have first of all to articulate what you want to do. And in our case, to improve vision everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. So when we say that, it means your strategy has to be absolutely global. You don't want to have anyone left over. Uh, so you have to develop a real global strategy. But doing this, even if you are big and powerful, eventually you can't do it alone. It means your strategy has also to develop a component with a lot of partners everywhere that you can use to join you. And when you do so, well, it influences your, your pricing strategy because you know you can't concentrate only on people being able to purchase eyeglasses at $500. So you have to have an offer, a marketing offer at every price point. Uh, the same way, when you invent a new a new formula, a new lens, a lens that actually could reduce, as an example, uh, myopia. You want it available for everyone. Mm -hmm. So you don't keep only your, uh, your research only for you. Uh, the same way when you're doing this, uh, you, you, you feel the power of what you actually are doing. So you, you can't afford to, to be actually, that you have to be totally irreproachable. It means your governance also I to follow, have to follow your own mission. Because mm -hmm. you're leading a corporation which has this power of having such an impact, you want your governance to be at the level of it. You, don't, you just don't want to, to give the power of giving vision to 5 billion people into the hands of a board of directors, of an executive committee, who do not have the same feeling. So this means you have to magnify your principles and values, but also build the board of directors that actually understand all this. Mm -hmm. You see, yep. you have such a powerful mission. It drives 
every component of your strategy from top to bottom. Yep. This is what I call mission above strategy. So, so yeah, I see that. I mean, you basically have to change everything uh, from you know marketing to distribution to including to your board. And so, obviously, my next question here is that because uh, that sounds great in practice, right? It's like, when did people tell you to calm down on that? I mean, like, again, so the the broader conversation I want to have now is on the tension between this mission, doing good, giving good vision to uh, to everybody on the world, doing good for the world. And then the necessity to make money for a company, right? So tell me about these tensions because um, there is a lot of hype right now around uh, business as a force for good, but uh, including uh, you know, researchers and, and, and faculty members in academia are now, you know, are now saying that this is being uh, overhyped, right? And we're not talking enough about the, the tensions between profit and purpose. So, when did your board of directors or your shareholders tell you, okay, Hubert, this is great, thank you very much, but we need cash. Can you tell me about that and how you went about this? I prefer to use the word performance. It's what I, when I talk about this internally or outside, I, 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 um, I used to say it's the two P's. It's purpose mm -hmm. and performance. Okay. Profit is something very different. I think shareholders are looking for more, for more than performance that purely profit. They should, anyway. Mm. So the two P's are extremely important and they, they are correlated, they are interconnected. Uh, you remember the story uh, that I, a few minutes ago about this uh, young girl, Jessica? Uh, Jessica, uh, minus four, is myopia, will, will continue to evaluate. All her life, she will need eyeglasses. By having given her the first pair at, at nine years old, she will find, and I am sure since, since um, 2005, she has found ways to get eyeglasses. So by having done this strategy, and here I am talking to investors, to board of directors, mm -hmm. to skeptical people, what I am telling them is we are creating the consumer of the future. We are actually moving, uh, uh, traditionally, the optical industry is growing at two to three, two to three percent. The 1.7 people, 1.7 billion people who purchase in optical store, yeah. uh, this mass grows at two to three percent. When suddenly, by doing good, by having impact on people, at the by giving eyeglasses free of charge with philanthropy, by selling them at five dollars through uh, inclusive business model, we are also creating the consumer of the future. So suddenly, the market is not 1.7; it's 1.7 billion plus 3 billion in the next 20 years. So the overall market will grow step by step from one from two percent to 10 percent. Yeah. And then this is how you value long-term, all your actions linked to the purpose. So obviously it doesn't, it, it changed totally the long-term performance of the corporation. So of course, every time we are doing to shareholders, we are talking to board of directors, or eventually also to new board members that actually want to join us. We are talking on the, let's say the more human part of our mission, the impact on the life of people but at the same time, the impact on profit and performance. So no, I never felt this tension at all. I've always been able to, ex to explain and to show the short-term impact and the long-term impact. Of course, what you're contemplating today when you look at all the uh, actions of Essilor Luxotica everywhere in the world, it's, it's a lot of people. We have around uh, 300 people working uh, around the... Uh, uh, Esso Luxotica uh, uh, mission division worldwide uh, today. But, so it's a lot of money. We spend 20, 40 million every year only for this. But it was not the case. We started with half a million and then it was step by step. So not that much impact on the profit on the PL every year, huge impact on the performance. So mission should be looked with the performance of the corporations. Mm -hmm. It is interconnected. 
So basically your pitch is, uh, yeah, I, I get it. It's not about making more money. It's about really about growing the market, right? But then let's go back to Jessica. I'm assuming the reason why uh, you met her uh, in, uh, with the, in, was it in Dallas, Texas, uh, with this bus while doing pro bono with your company is because she was coming from a poor background and never had a chance to go and see an opti uh, metrician. I forgot the, I don't know if I'm saying that name properly in English. So, but basically you're betting on the fact that she will be able to afford glasses after you've given her her first pair. Um, is that true? Will she be able to afford that later on? And same questions for your market in India, where you're betting on population which need to have the money to ultimately buy these glasses. Um, along the story of the development of the ACLR mission uh, with uh, our CMO giant back then, um, there was a kind of uh, epiphany moment yeah. where uh, I was in India. We had many various uh, uh, inclusive models, buses, making eyeglasses, satellites, actually to send data to some hospital and all these kinds of things. Uh, a lot of things, but not really at the magnitude of the, the need for better vision in India. And you know, uh, when you want to move ahead, you need data. So I was so shocked by the gap between the need and the demand that I asked my Indian team to say, well, I want really to know what impact we had on the people we, we gave uh, at that time, eyeglasses five years, three years, 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we were very fortunate at that time with the, the foundation of the Boston Consulting Group, we co-funded a survey and we came back, found around 1,000 um, people in India to whom we gave or we sold for uh, 200 rupees eyeglasses. And mm -hmm. asking them basic questions, uh, did that an impact on your life? What have you done after? Have you mm -hmm. uh, 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 eyeglasses when your corrections, uh, your vision corrections have changed? All these kinds of things. The results came as a shock. First, 86% of them said loud and clear, it has changed my life. And then when we came to the why and how, yeah. mm -hmm. in India, where we did it, Uttar Pradesh, some poor, uh, let's say, a little poorer uh, state in, um, in India, the first, re the first reason why it changed their life was safety. Safety. Okay. Able to see better because I walk barefoot and without eyeglasses, I am unable to see where I put my foot, my feet, yeah. on broken glasses or a snake. Yeah. Being better, my self esteem has changed. I can go out, I feel safer, and then I could contribute to my own little community. Of course, the second reason why is I was able to find a job okay. or an activity. The third one kept my activity and so on. So, and then 100% of them has found a way to get a second pair, either because okay. they were able to find uh, another vision camp free of charge or because they felt the importance of vision, of having a good vision. They did the one day, two days journey to which uh, a city of a village was a, where there was an optical store, you know, uh, having a good vision is an addiction. <laughs> once, once you got a clear vision, you, ju you just don't want to get rid of your eyeglasses. Mm. You find ways. And this was a key moment, actually, where after that, we decided to accelerate our programs. And with Sogota in India, which, is leading all those pro which was leading all those programs at these times, we did accelerate and build all the programs which are today active within the... Uh, is still an exotic addition. Okay, so the, the measurement of, of that impact could... Uh, yeah, we have to measure it, oh, absolutely. Okay. It's extremely important when you have a mission. Uh, it, same story happened to, to us actually um, in China. Uh, you see, uh, I was, this was maybe 10 years ago, uh, um, I was uh, uh, in Xiamen <laughs> with uh, our, our Chinese team and I saw 
thousands of people in the street with no glasses. My God, we know they are topics, they know this. So we started to count them. At the corner, count them one by one. Only 7% of them had eyeglasses. It's insane. Uh, and when then, a um, few months after, I came to uh, having a discussion with the head of uh, Ministry of Health, we actually measure that. And then we are able to actually provide data to help government to take the right decisions. Passion is important. Data is extremely important. Yes, yeah, so that's what I was going to say. I mean, in terms of also the, your, your double P, uh, purpose and performance, what I'm hearing is that what's very important is to be able to demonstrate with yes. numbers behind that performance. So it's about market growth, but it's also about- Demonstrate and then measure. Yeah. Measure the impact you're having. Mm -hmm. uh, of so, course, yeah. at Tessor Luxotica, we started by funding our own programs. Now we are leveraging funds. We have a we have a fundraising division. We are in order to accelerate and to develop uh, our impact. And, and we need to measure our impact in a very, very precise way. So mm -hmm. people feel comfortable, will feel comfortable donating to our programs uh, for having impact on people. Thanks for this. And just, I mean, we don't have um, much time to dig into uh, the different business uh, and financial models of growing, uh, growing that access in India. But I just wanted to mention that there is uh, an inside case that looks into part of that with Aimitra that was uh, prepared by uh, Professor, Professor uh, Jajit Singh uh, together with Jayant, your CMO. Anyway, so we'll put it also for our okay. uh, the audience to see, but uh, uh, this is also stories that are brought in the classroom uh, here in SEAD. Now, obviously, the next question I have about, um, you know, some of the challenges associated to mission above strategy comes to uh, the merger. Well, so we've had tons of questions about the merger. I will suggest we dedicate a, a specific webinar to that. <laughs> what I'm interested in uh, discussing with you now is how did you uh, keep that focus on mission above strategy through the merger, right? Uh, what was hard there? What didn't work? What did you have to fight? And did you succeed in keeping, uh, in keeping that drive uh, through the, the merger that uh, you led? Soon three years, you started to lead some three years ago, no? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. No, this was actually a really, uh, really an easy thing. Um, first of all, because Luxotica has the same type of activities. Luxotica, uh, for, uh, for years, even back then, before Luxotica, when it was Lenscrafters in the States, mm -hmm. they are their own uh, One Vision uh, uh, foundation. So Luxotica has taken uh, this one side foundation uh, within their own uh, business and they have developed it. it. So the, we, ha we have the same DNA. Uh, Luxotica was more, is more on uh, pure philanthropy. Mm -hmm. uh, we are similar, we are more really on social impact business, um, but we have the same DNA. And um, when you have a mission about improving vision, I've never found someone against. There is no controversy about uh, improving vision. Uh, so uh, it was really, let's say, uh, one area which have gathered everyone. Uh, I think when you do a merge, it's very important to actually allow, to have a long-term objective, someone that actually will gather all the teams. Making a merge is always complicated. All the merge are not easy to uh, to actually uh, go through. Uh, but when you have such a non-controversy mission, which is to improve life, to improve, uh, to improve the, the self-esteem of people by giving them a beautiful eyeglasses or sunglasses, then it gathers everyone. So it has helped a lot within the merge because this was a topic where everyone was absolutely aligned. Absolutely okay. So how did it help? I mean, how did it help solve uh, more of the, you know, challenging issues? But I mean, again, when you do a merge, you do a lot of talking, a lot of explanations. You do a lot of meetings. Uh, when you start showing uh, the story of Jessica, and we have thousands of stories like Jessica around the world, on Luxotica side, and uh, then suddenly you gather everyone. I think one of the first uh, team, uh, team work we did together 
was going, uh, ici leur team, Luxottica teams, doing vision camp together everywhere in the world, from Paris, from New York, from, uh, uh, I remember one in Thailand too. Uh, again, uh, it was the best way to gather people and show that we have a common goal. Uh, even though the road could be bumpy, financially speaking, governance speaking, the objective is so important that it erases any form of uh, difficulty. So again, I mean, in Emerge, it was the, <laughs> the thing that actually helped us to concentrate because we all know that we have impact and it is more important than any fights. Yep, and I, I guess, I mean, I will look, but there might be more questions about that. I wanted to, to get into a little bit of the nuts and bolts about uh, how to push um, and how to push the, the mission uh, and that focus throughout a company, in particular a company that is uh, present in so many countries. Uh, and as you say, with the strategy that deliver at different price points in different contexts. So you, you created a number of initiatives. I think what I, um, what I picked up on and seems to be quite powerful in all these initiatives was your creation of the CMO position, the chief mission officer. Is this, uh, can you tell more about that? How did that idea of having a chief mission officer come up and uh, what's, what's the mandate of that person? Yeah, so again, uh, um, um, this came up after uh, an offsite executive uh, committee meeting we had in South of France around 2008 or seven, something like this, where we presented all the results of the BCG survey in India and all what we are doing. And when we realized that we really wanted to accelerate all this. So it's like every project. First of all, you need a leader. You need someone that actually will uh, roll his leaves and uh, take this project and move ahead. The point was then how to do it and who to choice. Uh, and this is where we decided that because it was so important that this initiative will report to me as, as CEO and chairman, which was the easy decision. Then you have to find someone. Yes, so how did you find the person? Start vanilla, there is nothing. And mm -hmm. I remember that day when I came to, uh, to Giant, who was uh, at that time the, the CEO of, uh, I think, all Southeast Asia plus India and everything. And I told him, Giant, I want you to be my chief mission officer. Yes, yes, fine. So what is the PNL now, Iber? How many, yes. how many people in my team? And I told Giant, no, you're alone and you have no budget to start with. Let's build what your needs will be, and then we move forward. And uh, I was very fortunate because he jumped into it. Uh, he got a budget day two. <laughs> and, uh, but again, the message here is, if you want to move ahead and then put your mission above your strategy, you have to articulate very well your mission. Mm. You have to articulate a mission which is credible for the corporation. Yeah. You have to articulate a mission where everyone in your corporation will recognize that we look and, and that they can contribute from the clerk, someone, from someone working on, on a machine in a plant, someone working in marketing. Anyone should find a way, if they want, to contribute. So it's a little, it took, take, it, sometimes it takes a lot of time to really articulate well your mission. Once this is done, this is true, that when it is, let's say, uh, directly under the responsibility of the chairman, of the CEO, it gives a visibility. Uh, it, it helps to cut the angles and to move ahead. But very important is to make sure that it does not diverge to a mission for some happy few. It has to be a mission where everyone within your corporation could find a way, have the feeling that they do contribute by doing their daily job. So, and we actually have a lot of questions. I'm starting to look at them as well about that, because basically that means, a, you know, a cultural change, right? And so you're sitting here at the head of that uh, company, in particular now that sells a uh, super expensive, uh, you know, I don't know, Reban aviator uh, sunglasses uh, on the west uh, coast of the US, all the way to a pair of, uh, you know, vision 
um, glasses for Jessica to uh, another kid who has vision impairment in the middle uh, of India. So how do the staff uh, selling these different type of glasses all feel that they belong to your company and to that mission? How do you make that happen? Because it's not the same kind of job, it's not the same kind of product. And someone could argue or less about uh, real impact on changes people's life, no? Yeah, of course. Uh, we pay a lot of attention to this. It is not easy. Uh, we have successes, we have failure, like everywhere. I think uh, what's important is to understand the impact you're having when you are selling eyeglasses. Uh, when someone in Manhattan or in London or whatever, actually, uh, we have people selling uh, fantastic uh, uh, Ray-Ban uh, sunglasses or uh, Chanel frames with the best Varilux transitions from Essilor and they 2000, 2000 euro or dollar for this. Well, she or he feels better, uh, definitely. So we have an impact. Uh, part of the profit we are doing is helping also to fund all the activities we are having. Uh, most of the times, this is, uh, you're talking about uh, reps or salesperson or marketing people, mm -hmm. sometimes they are doing this. They spend time, or they dedicate, and they give time uh, as the volunteers on all our programs everywhere in the world. So I think there are many ways to connect and link the things. Above all, uh, when you make someone much more happy, much more, let's say, comfortable, you, you increase his self-esteem uh, because she or he sees well, then you have achieved your mission. At, if they pay two thousand dollars, if they pay if they pay one dollar for uh, mm -hmm. five NVG frame uh, in a remote area, you change their life, you improve their life, and you feel good. Yeah. So I mean, I need. To, I think... It's all about paying attention on how you gather everyone around yeah. your overall mission. And I think we have to just recall that you've been at that in the company for, for over 15 years, right? One five. So I think it doesn't, it's not something that happens, uh, you know, uh, um, overnight. And, and I just wanted to go back to your, to the key role here of your chief mission officer, because basically together with you and a number of others, he's key, he played a key role in, um, in, in, uh, in the happening here, there, in really changing the culture. So my question is, do you need to hire a chief mission officer from within the company so that it works and it's successful? Um, again, it all depends at which stage you're developing your own uh, mission division or mission department. Uh, you need someone who, it's, it's, it's a very tough job. It's a complicated job. Le let me answer you by just describing what the Silo Luxotica uh, mission division is today. Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it has various departments. It has one which is focused on all philanthropic programs. So we animate maybe, I don't know, 40, 50 foundations around the world. And we are building links with thousands of small or big NGOs who are developing programs. Any NGO doing some uh, education somewhere, we plug our teams up with them and we make sure that when they do education, the kids or the, or the adults, uh, they do see well. So philanthropy. We have on the other spectrum a division which is creating and developing inclusive programs mm. where they produce eyeglasses at $1, we sell at $150, and it's sold through thousands, tens of thousands of, uh, let's say, urgentist optician mm -hmm. that we do create and we do train at, at four or five dollars. Uh, of course, there is a, we have to do a lot of communication. So there is communication and marketing. We have a, advocacy is extremely important. We have a team dedicated to advocacy around the world. Uh, and uh, maybe one of the most important is the supply chain, the logistic. When we develop tens of thousands of very tiny uh, micro entrepreneurs everywhere in the world, we need to supply them with eyeglasses, sunglasses, 
and it, we are talking about 10 to 20 millions of them. So, the, so building this supply chain at, a, at a extremely low cost. We have a bottom of the pyramid lab where we experiment and we develop new technology for very, very, very low cost high, glass, uh, high test. Uh, we have re-engineered the eyeglasses from the lens to remove complexity and reduce the cost. So someone has to lead. It's a, it's, it's a business within the business. Yeah. Uh, when you start, the only advice I can give, if you start from scratch, uh, passion and dedication is the most important. Credibility is the most important. Yeah. And I hired giant from, in, from, uh, from Singapore and India. He had the credibility of what he has done. Mm -hmm. Businessman, very successful. When Arnaud is now leading uh, the Esiolutica mission, he has been extremely successful in China. Yeah. Uh, so I think it all depends at which maturity of your mission you are. Outsiders are welcome, of course. Um, but it all depends where you start, where you want to go. Thank you, Hubert. So uh, I'm, I'm starting to pick up the questions that are coming in. But what I'm hearing from you is that when you start, as you started from scratch, you don't hire, you don't hire out a chief mission officer. <laughs> you, you can, you can, you can, you can, uh, you can actually get uh, what you don't have uh, inside. Mm -hmm. Someone who really had uh, this type of experience. 20 years ago, it did not exist that much. Really? Uh, in 2021, 2025, it's a it's a more and more talents that you could hire. But back then, 20 years ago, it was not the case. And for you, what uh, also in preparing what, what you told me is that you actually have a number, should your CMO move on somewhere else? Uh, and that will not be the case, but you also have a number of highly talented people who are ready to take on that function, possibly. I mean, we have, been, we, have been, we have been very fortunate because with, with such, a, with such a, uh, an impactful mission, yeah. we, have attracted, we have attracted extremely high qualified talents from everywhere in the world, actually, who moving from consulting, from big, large corporations, from young entrepreneurs, women, men, and it's a team of really, really, we are very fortunate. Very talented people. Thanks, Hubert. So we have too many questions for me to handle. So we're going to have now, we're going to do short answers and we're going to try to have a, a faster pace. But let's pick up from that though. What are the KPIs of your CMO? There is a bunch of questions around measurement huh? and the measuring. Num live, number of live. In, uh, in the main rooms of, uh, in, Singa in the Singapore office, where yeah. we have the, uh, the, the heart of the, uh, ACLA mission, this is and it's and now it's a Luxotica exotic mission. This is the number of lives we are helping one by one. Okay, thank Believe you. Me, with the pandemic, we got a drop. Yes, of course. With the key trajectory, the pandemic, we have lost one year, one year and a half because of the efficiency of the programs. Yep. That's that's a, that's a catastrophe, indeed. and that's a disaster. Yeah, triple yeah. triple uh, triple lives. populations. Yeah, so still in, uh, in the measurement sphere, uh, are you doing you know impact accounting at Estilor or Estilor Lexotica, integrating some of your positive and ex negative externalities in your PNL? Is this something you're looking at from an accounting? I'm not sure to, to understand your questions. Can I explain that again? Well, there is <laughs> an answer, and maybe. Not doing it. Are you doing a classic PNL or are you developing a PNL in your company that account for the impact that you are having in terms of uh, human capital? Uh, and environmental on, yes, on the back of the envelope. Okay. So in the formal way. Okay. Um, there, there are a lot of conversation around competition. How to handle competition when you have same thing, your North Stars being on purpose. Um, so how, how I mean, there is no competition. <laughs> I mean, uh, I am, <laughs> there is no competition. Why? Because there is one goal, which is to eradicate poor vision from the world in one generation. Everyone is welcome. Anyone, anyone who actually could find a way, because they are listening to us today, because they are looking at our programs, they decide to purchase eyeglasses from somewhere else. 
who cares? We are helping her or him to see better. And if today she or he has not purchased my product, having a good vision is an addiction. One day, in five years, in 10 years, in 20 years, she or he will purchase my product. I am the vast chairman. My product are the best. One day they will win. So maybe just to add to that, yeah, good pitch. Just to add to that, maybe you can touch two words on the fact that you are also embracing an open business model at, uh, at Estilor. You were at Estilor, and I think it's still the case at Estilor Luxotica in terms of how you work with others. Yeah, when I say with, when I talk about open business model, it's really within the DNA of Estilor since day one. Uh, uh, as an example is when we, uh, 30 years ago, we uh, invented the first photochromic lens transitions. We could have kept the patents only for us and actually on be, being the only one selling this transition lens was not the case. We decided to actually widely make our patents available through a venture to all our competitors because that lens was extremely important for the vision of uh, under some type of lights. Uh, so we have within a silos mm -hmm. of open business model. It means that when we have those programs, again, we are welcoming anyone from, uh, from our partners, our uh, distributors, our competitors, just to join. And we have alliances where actually they contribute and they spend time and energy and provide products. Mm -hmm. Again, it, it, is in the, it is for generation and generation in the DNA, into the DNA of the company. Yeah, yeah, so that came, that came beforehand. And actually, there were questions of that about what did you inherit? So it's a, you've said huh? it's, a, it's a quite an old company uh, uh, has existed for uh, over 170 years, right? So why, what is it that you inherited from your successors and what from the company already had and you could, you could build on to uh to 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 push your 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 change in business model well i mean uh thousands of things yeah first of all uh uh the, the quality of uh the product we are doing mm -hmm. the high level of research which allow us to do high-end product but also twist the research and by i was explaining by decreasing the complexity to actually make much more affordable product. A, a huge and significant culture uh, um, within a seller, as you know, and it, maybe it's another topic one day, mm -hmm. but employee shareholders program are extremely yes. important. Yeah. When you the company, we are maybe, I don't know, 10% uh, 10, uh, 10, 10 of the company was 10% was, uh, of the employees were shareholders. Today, within Essilor, we are around 80% of the employees worldwide. All the manufacturing plants in, uh, in Brazil, China, India, they are all shareholders. So it gives it give a reach, it gives uh, an audience, uh, it gives also the object that actually we have much more, uh, it's much more easy to gather energy towards an objective. Yeah, so that's another thing. All very... the ingredients were there. Uh, I mean, since day one within the Silver, people were doing vision camps and doing philanthropy. Yeah. So what, I, what we have added the past 20 years was really just connecting the dots, mm -hmm. articulating actually the message and promoting the message as a mission and a goal for the corporation. And I think that's very important because that helped answer and better understand also how you know you could uh, you could have that culture of uh, of purpose within the company. You know, it uh, of course you uh, you pull it together, you articulated it for everybody, but you had these important building blocks. And I think it's a teamwork. It is a teamwork, and it's a cumulative teamwork too. So I, your your brother is in the audience, and I don't know if he's the one who <laughs> who told you you should take the CEO job. It's Pierre, is he the one? Yeah, it's him. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. Thank you, Pierre. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I want to ask his question because I think it's it's personal, and I think I, I'm, I'm naming him. Is there a fundamental fact or value from our childhood that have prepared you to such a job? And that could be used by others to also be better prepared. So we're getting very personal here, but I could yeah, do it. Well, I think, 
I think everyone has in his uh, in his in his soul the wish to actually uh, do things and and develop. I think like everyone uh, and a lot of people, uh, your your education, your family, the way you have behaved drives you to actually do the actions you're having. Uh, uh, oh my God, I am not alone, and there are thousands and millions of people like us actually who uh, who do that. But one day you could have an epiphany. Luck is extremely important. Yeah. It's, it's, it's crazy to say that, but even though when you have the, the ground, when you have actually uh, the values, the principles, the, the culture, the willingness, the curiosity, the mm -hmm. naive, to be extremely naive, being naive is extremely important as a CEO. Yeah, I'm, I'm strongly <laughs> of uh, a little bit of naivety is extremely important. Uh, then, then when suddenly you have a little power given by the structure you're working is, in or, or for, uh, then actually you can do things. But again, I love when you are saying, Katel, don't wait to be a CEO, don't wait to be the top. Talk now, okay. And that's gonna, I, I'm gonna keep that for my final question. Before that, it, along the same line as the question also for your brother and what we heard a little bit in my intro is like, how do you uh, keep your inspiration? How do you refuel? I mean, what are your, do you have any source of inspiration, uh, role models, religion, family? Some people want to know more about you. So we've heard about the Arctic expeditions, anything else? Seriously, when I am depressed, yes, what did you do? someone at the mission and say, can I join a vision camp? I want to see the smile of Jessica. Seriously. And again, uh, I know that thousands and thousands of uh, Essilor and Luxottica people, they do the same. Some mm -hmm. days are totally, I mean, oh my God, it's a bad day from day one. You need a smile. And when you just look at the smile of people who are giving eyelashes, then it changes your day. And like everyone, of course, you have your moment where you need to relax. And this is true that uh, doing cross-country cross skiing in, uh, in the Arctic helped me to, there is no phone, there is no one. It's me with my two or two friends or my kids and just skiing for seven hours. Then you can redo the total strategy of Essor Luxotica in one day. Thanks, Hubert, for that. And so just, I think, so first, and now I want to finish with a few tips. I know it's hard, I know it's hard, but I think it's good because you've had, you've had a lot of people who've logged on and they're here and probably got inspired as I was by what you've said. So I am today a CEO of a company, not yet, but I might be. Uh, and I've heard you and I'm like, oh my God, now I'm old enough to start uh, shaking things a little bit. And I want to start pushing mission above strategy in my company. Where do I start? Uh, first. Be clear, be, take the time to articulate what you want to do. Take the time to articulate something that actually you and your company will be credible. In it, I am doing sometimes this exercise with outsiders and corporations who ask yeah. me to, to animate a debate on, oh ah, my God, what is my mission? I, uh, I'm doing this, this. It's, it's not that easy, but just have a different look. Uh, uh, look from another angle, mm -hmm. like sometimes out of the box, but look from another angle to what you're doing. Find a way to have an impact. You have an impact in any case. And then hold your leaves and start the fight. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I guess we'll end here. Uh, start the fight, find the purpose. I think that we've heard you in terms of the, the importance to take the time for the mission, to be clear about the mission and to um, also uh, hear it within you to, to start that journey. Thank you so much uh, you, for uh, joining us today from Quebec. It was lovely to, uh, to have you. We couldn't answer all the questions, unfortunately. Um, that's, uh, that's part of the game. We can organize a, a follow-up questions. I also wanted to thank everybody who's joined us. Thank you for your time spent with us. I also wanted to thank the team whom you are not seeing, but is making these webinars happening. It's a big crowd. So here they are. And today we have the whole women led support team working at the back end. Uh, I also have to talk to you about upcoming webinars in INSEAD Lifelong Learning. 
you're seeing it here, there is much more happening. For this conversation today with Hubert, it's been taped, it will be put online. And uh, if you want to hear about specific people, specific topics, do not hesitate to reach out to us. We're here to serve you. Thank you very much. Have a good day, everybody. Stay safe and see you soon on Inside Lifelong Learning.